Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. This CUNY Law School's motto is law in the service of human needs. It may be the city university's best gift to the public. And because it's so special, it's able to attract exceptional leaders like its new dean, Michelle Anderson. Welcome. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. I don't know where to start if I talk about you or the law school because both of them are very <laughs> exciting and interesting. So let's Thanks. start with you. Okay. You were brought, you went to college in, in California. Yes. Is that where you were brought up? No, my father was in the Air Force, so we moved a lot. every year almost, right. every other year. Were you on the Santa Cruz campus? Of, yes, I went to know, UC Santa Cruz. And as that's an the place that everybody always thinks everybody's lounging around having a wonderful time. Uh, there right? is a little lounging. Right. Amidst the redwoods. It's a nice place to lounge. <laughs> it must be beautiful. <laughs> but you studied, and I gather you did a lot, your major was something involving community and social change. Yes, yes. What made that? happen? How did you get to that point? Oh, I've always been interested in social justice issues. As an undergraduate, I was on the board of directors of CalPERG, the California Public Interest Research oh, Group, right. yeah. and knocked on doors for the environment and, and did some feminist work, learned to teach women self-defense and taught that, have continued to teach that. Um, and so I've al always been interested in social change. It's so interesting and that it interest. comes from an Army family, right? Air Force. Air Force. Yes. That's very, is that different? Um, I, I don't know. I think military families are probably pretty similar. Yeah. It, it was a traditional family yeah. structure, but um, and um, that traditional family structure raised, uh, you know, feminists. Yeah, feminists. So great. Yeah. It's I, you always wonder how what what it is that strikes somebody. How they how they yeah. you know how did the, you take this path in life and. What's the difference between you and someone who says, yes, I'm a woman, but I'm not a feminist or something like that? Yes, gosh, I think my father was always uh, a committed anti-racist, both my, both my mother and my father. Um, and we moved a lot, and we talked about race relations a lot. Um, around the dinner table, we would talk about what was going on in the news and what was going on in the world. Yeah. Um, and you just have to have a, a commitment to trying to understand injustice, yeah. to start to it's see true. women's role right. within society, right. I think. And he had three daughters that he most likely adored and thought were wonderful? Yes, and he used to tell yeah. us all, uh, you can do anything. I have an older brother as well. Yeah. And my father would tell each one of us, you can be anyone, you can do anything. And uh, the law for me was a way to think about doing something that I wanted so to do. So interesting, because it's a wonderful way to change what goes there yes. and bring justice. Then you went to Yale Law School. Yes. Then you what? You volunteered for a judge, some such thing, you interned with a judge. Yeah, I was but a then clerk. you land up in South Africa. Were you in South Africa or were you working on a project? Actually, I did the work in South Africa in 1992 in my first summer of law school, and I was doing um, I was doing human rights work, looking particularly in 1992. A number of folks in political detention were being released. This was just as apartheid was breaking down as right. a formal social structure, a formal legal structure. Um, uh, and and what I wanted to do was to interview folks who were coming out of detention and to talk about the role that sexual assault played in the control of political, particularly female political detainees. So I traveled to South Africa on a couple human rights fellowships that first summer of law school. Um, and then after that, in law school, started to develop my scholarly interest in rape law. Um, and have really carried that through as a law I've professor. Yeah, I've seen that. Did you have a Lowenstein Fellowship? Is well, that, Lowenstein I is the, um, it, I was part of um, the Lowenstein um, International Human Rights Clinic is that at Yale Allard? Law School. For yes, Allard. yes. I ran his campaign, his oh, first campaign for Congress, so I was always world. interested to see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was a Ford Foundation Fellowship right. and a Shell Fellowship. Now, when you, there was just another ad today in the paper for Darfur, Darfur, yes, about rape. Yes. And what is the political? What is that? What is the connection between the politics and rape? Um, I wish there were a simple answer. I think rape is a way. Um, it's a. It's fundamentally a way to degrade and uh, fracture someone's spirit, particularly women, particularly in cultures where sexual uh, uh, chastity is considered a, of high value, or sexual fidelity is considered of high value. Um, 
which is really around the globe, it's considered yes. of high value. So um, rape or aggression against women that is sexualized or aggression against men that is sexualized is really a way to fracture the spirit. So it was a number of, of members of the international human rights community who came together. Rhonda Copeland, a professor yes. at right. uh, CUNY Law School among them, who really tried to develop the norm that rape could be considered an instrument of genocide. And uh, she was really on the forefront of trying to get that declared a violation of international law. It's it, it's it's such a, a common thing, and it happens. Yes. I mean, it's all over. Yes. So, but then you went. You were a lawyer. Then you clerked for a judge. Then you landed up teaching. I mean, you yes. ran a clinic, didn't you, in Georgetown? So yes. you got some practical experience about yes, yes. what is a practicing attorney? Yeah, I did. Um, two What's the difference, before we go on, sure, between sure. an attorney and a lawyer? Why do, how do we use these terms? I think the terms are interchangeable. Um, it's funny, I was just talking with someone the other day, and I think some people think of lawyers as being a little more down home and community oriented, and oh, attorneys being a, a more highfalutin term, but people use them interchangeably. I, I think lawyer sounds more... Is that funny? Yes, oh, that's it is. great. It's a Great thing. That's great. Right. So, so maybe the, it's just contextual. So you ran a clinic that involved community people poor people or yes. people who needed help. I worked in the appellate litigation clinic for two years at Georgetown doing criminal defense work and also some disability discrimination work. And then I was a visiting uh, professor at the Institute for Public Representation, which is another clinic at Georgetown focusing on disability discrimination. So both were fantastic, just, just wonderful jobs to, to get your feet wet, to practice real litigation, to, to learn and to teach um, Georgetown students at the same time, um, so it was a, there was just a quite a bit of synergy going on. And right then there. to Villanova, where you were teach, teaching, yes, and writing, yes, and appearing yes. and talking, yes. So talk to us more about your your major interest in in the sexual. Yeah. Well, uh, is it go beyond rape? I mean, is it sexual assault? Yes, is, yes. And the way that that um, my interest is in. Um, the historical evolution of rape law, the lack of prohibitions on all, a whole range of kinds of sexual assault that we consider fundamentally problematic today, um, and the ways that we made major progress as a result of the feminist movement in the 70s and 80s, but that progress was stunted and for a whole range of political and social reasons. And um, so what I want to do is really to move the law forward. Rape law has been an area that has been um, fundamentally about the control of women um, and, and has not been about sexual autonomy, which is the way right. we like to conceive of what rape law should be doing today. Right. Um, so that would include date rape, yes. matrimonial rape, yes. and of course respecting the rights of a woman, period. Yes, and of course, historically, there was um, a marital rape exemption in rape right. law. And um, so recently, I wrote an article re-examining that marital rape exemption. And what you see across the states today is that the that uh, the vast majority of states have eliminated the marital rape exemption for the most egregious forms of forcible sexual assault. But they have kept it in place for a whole range of so-called lesser assaults, so um, sex without consent, for instance, as opposed to sex due to beating or mm. sex from force or with a weapon. Sex uh, without consent is often um, subjected to a marital rape exemption in many states. So we have a long way to go to obtain full equality for women who are married um, and, and uh, for women across the spectrum. I've also looked some at date rape, which is an area that historically we have not criminalized in any meaningful way. Um, and I don't think as a culture we're fundamentally dealing with the issue of, of sexual assault in a way that, that best protects the autonomy of, of individuals. I mean, it's not very far back that you had to have a witness mm -hmm. to the rape. There um, so historically, you think about right, it. Yeah. right. Historically, there were corroboration requirements in rape law that were not required for other felonies. There were require requirements of a prompt complaint that someone came forward promptly to report. Now we know that victims of sexual trauma are much more likely not to report at all to anyone, much less to authority figures. Um, so the prompt complaint doesn't make a lot of sense. Additionally, what we know is that. Sexual assault happens without 
most often without the application of physical force. So without a bruise ending up or without the use of a weapon. It's because sexual assault happens so often between people who know one another, um, uh, people who are peers within a family, um, people who are on a date together. And in those circumstances, coercive, verbal coercion is effective in, in and pinning or effective rather than the kind of traditional classic rape that we think of as somebody jumping out of the bushes. So does, does rape or sexual assault come under the whole title of violence against women? Yes, yes. it does. And included within that broader title would be uh, battering of battering. wives or any, you know, child sexual abuse, which of course happens to boys as well, um, as well. Um, yeah, and now we have um, what are the, the 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 recruitment of women and bringing them here for sex. What? Yes, yes. So international sexual trade, the, right. the the trade of women internationally from primarily impoverished countries where they don't have a lot of options economically, um, and and in terms of autonomy, to uh, wealthier countries where folks are willing to pay and where there's a demand for right. um, this kind of sexual enslavement and, and the relationship. With with prostitution, any? Sure. Um, the uh, you know there's a relationship on a whole range of levels. First, when women or girls or boys get into prostitution, often when they're minors, um, uh, because they're fleeing home, they're homeless, they're fleeing sexual abuse at home. Not all prostitution starts that way, but a substantial portion starts yes. with incest and yeah. homelessness. So that's something that you have to take into account the connections between child sexual abuse and later. When we Talk about abuse. sex workers. Yeah, is that more, does that connote a more voluntary choice? I think it's intended to by those who advocate that term. I, the term's controversial. Oh, it um, is. Yeah, the term is controversial because some folks argue, look, sexual calling the person a sex worker is a way of making sexual the bartering of sex the same as other work, yeah. um, in the same way that the bartering right. of other services is. Right. So that's that's some, somewhat controversial, um, and there are different positions that shake out depending on on how you think about those terms. So now you're in Queens. Yes, <laughs> which I love, and it's how do you relate? this work, your interests to the law school. Yeah. Well, the, but you've got a broader interest. I mean, right. we must go back to that, right? Right. The, so. the, I'm, I'm interested in public interest work. My commitment to the, the right. reason I became a law professor wa initially was to influence young minds in terms of the critical approaches they bring to the law and the way that they can uh, commit okay. themselves to change the law for the better in whatever way they think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so my fundamental commitments as a professor and as a scholar really coincided with the fundamental mission of CUNY School of Law, which is about, as you mentioned, law in the service of human needs. We aim to produce the most outstanding public interest attorneys in the country. And we send more students into public interest and public service work percentage-wise than any other law school in the country. So we really are singularly um, important in terms of our justice agenda as a, as a mm. legal academy, and also we're an incredible asset to the New York area. Mm. And how? Do, do you um, connect the diversity of the, of the student body to the interests of public interest? Absolutely. We have a a twin mission, really. Um, one mission is about uh, producing outstanding public interest attorneys. And the twin mission is really to produce those attorneys who reflect the extraordinary diversity of New York City. And, and traditionally, the law has not served well certain communities. It has, it has underserved communities of color, immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. And so it's our job as part of a public interest mission to really try to diversify the legal profession mm -hmm. and certainly to um, use the opportunities that diversity bring to the learning process <coughs> at the school Excuse itself. Me. So do you find that people who come from the less affluent communities and, and most likely people of color or from other countries are have a special interest in public interest law? I think so. Um, folks who, it's, it's interesting, folks who come from less often, they know what it means exactly. to be in a place where they don't have an attorney. Right. Uh, let me give you an example. We have one alumni, Mercedes Cano, who's truly outstanding. She came to this country at 17 from Colombia, was undocumented here, 
took a while to become documented in this country. She graduated from Queens College and then had, went on to the law school and now has opened up, had an Echoing Green Fellowship upon graduation and has now opened up a center to serve Latinos, Latinas in the New York area who are undocumented. So mm, she comes great. from a place of knowing what it means not yes. to have access to legal resources. Right. And so she has turned around and she's given back to her community. We find that again and again. We really attract outstanding students who are committed to serving and committed and, to giving back. And see your school as an opportunity to be yes. able to really fulfill their dreams and their hopes, I yes, guess. Yes, yes. Now, you, the CUNY Law School also has, it runs a program of assistance to yes. some of these attorneys or lawyers yes. who go into small practices. Yes. It sounds like a wonderful idea. We, we, we do. We have two amazing programs. One is the clinical program in the law school itself where students go through intensive practice experiences supervised by professors where they actually, and they re they actually go and represent people. Mm -hmm. um, we serve about a thousand people in the New York area every year through our clinics. Our clinics are truly outstanding. They're ranked fifth in the nation. And what clinics are they? There is a clinic serving elder law. There is an immigration and refugee rights clinic. There is an international women's rights clinic. There is a battered women's clinic. There um, are, is a mediation clinic. There's an equality um, clinic. We just oh have boy. a whole, it goes on and on. So every student at one point or another is connected to a clinic. We're one of the few <laughs> law schools in the country that, that actually kind of require. We, we not only offer, we actually require students to have intensified and intense practice experience before they graduate. Now, that clinic, the clinic is really what we're known for in the larger legal academy because we're ranked so highly, fifth in the nation. Um, ahead of my alma mater, Yale, which is uh -huh. ranked at sixth. So well, that makes uh, you feel good. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and then what we do is we continue to support our, our students when they graduate and go into public interest law. So we have what's called the Community Legal Resources Network. And, and this network is where we want to support our graduates going out to do that pro bono and low bono, the sort of sliding scale practice mm -hmm. work in impoverished communities throughout New York City. So how is that funded? This is funded um, through a, a range of things, private grants, individuals, right. the city, um, the, the so I, I, when you offer, so somebody has is in private practice yeah. and they have a case that they need some help, they contact I forget his well, name. Well, here's what we do. Here's Yeah, it's Fred Rooney runs yeah. the program, and he's a, a graduate right. of the law school. Now, does he then use student, uh, do students help, or who helps? No, what happens is, this is this is great. Oh, you the find idea, another firm. No, this is, this is what we do. <laughs> we have a network. We use the internet and we use technology to network folks together so that someone who is just starting out and opening, you know, putting out a shingle yeah. and starting out right. in Jackson Heights right. can ask on the on the listserv, look, I've got a client who has this problem and I've never faced this problem before. And there are oh, that's, so it's right, a hundreds and of assistance. other people who have done this work long term that's and great. who provide mentorship and who give, you know, this happens in big firms all the time. Mm -hmm. you you go to Cravath and you have a problem and you know that there are hundreds of other attorneys who faced this problem before and you can use them as resources. Okay. When you're doing low bono and pro bono public you know, public interest practice on the street, mm -hmm. you're not connected with a huge right. firm. But the Community Legal Resources Network connects That's people up. That's so good. Yeah. So do you, what are the students? How many students are there? There are about 450 students. And what's the faculty? The faculty is about 40. Depends on how you count. Yeah. About 30 to 40. And they're wonderful. The students are, I've taught at uh, Georgetown. I've taught at Villanova. I've taught at the University of Pittsburgh. And, and I gotta say, CUNY <laughs> law students are truly amazing. They come to, come to the law school often with an extraordinary background. They, um, uh, I spoke to a student the other day who had, who was a social worker for many years before she came to law school. Uh, another uh, person was in the Peace Corps. Another person uh, worked 
for AmeriCorps for a number of years. Another person was deeply involved in theater before he So you came. have a higher age level, we average do. age. We do, we do. And which we have is a, a, Which is the way I've always thought education yes, should be, shouldn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. Well, the, the students who are more interesting are st and, and I think more able to grapple with the law in a realistic yeah. way are students who have some yeah. experience before and they how come many in. And how many people do you know who've gone to law school, become lawyers, and then change their profession? Yeah. A lot. And see, this is the thing so with this CUNY. this is almost reverse. We have students who are, n who are committed to practicing yeah. law, and yeah. they don't do it because there's nothing else to do right. and they're not or good at math, it, yeah. right? They don't go to law school for those reasons. They go to law school and they're attracted to CUNY law because of a commitment to giving back, a commitment right. to serving. So we get our graduates practice law. You know, many graduates of different law schools mm -hmm. go out and they use the law degree mm -hmm. to kind of get somewhere else. But our law students who become graduates and, and, and then attorneys, they're deeply involved in the communities of New York, deeply involved in serving the community. Do you have any judges yet? Yes, we do. do. We've got, good. I think we've got four judges in Queens Ooh, alone. Very good. Yeah. I'm That's, very, very Isn't proud that an interesting thing? That yeah. is, that would be big, big help too. Yes. So in your law school, there really isn't a question that people of color don't have the same opportunities, that women don't have the same opportunities because right. your school is just that, right? Right, we have the most diverse law faculty of any faculty in the country. Um, uh, there are more female students than male students, which is actually true to a number of schools now. Um, there is, um, we're one of the most diverse student, have one of the most diverse student bodies of any law school in the country, and we're consistently ranked as having one of the most diverse student bodies. And your campus? Is we're located just near, we're located in Flushing, near the Queens College campus. But it's near, it's not on. It's separate? Yeah, it is separate. separate. Yeah. yeah, but right next to, we're next door neighbors. <laughs> yeah. So I read a blog of yours where you, uh, you said you were getting married. Yes, I just got married. <laughs> and I loved it. It was a wonderful blog. You were embarrassed <laughs> that you were going to subject yourself to this usual historic custom. And I see that you're yeah, even wearing got, rings. Got a and, it, and, yeah. and you didn't want to tell your students that you didn't want anybody to know. And then funny? everybody was so happy. Right. <laughs> so is it different than what you thought it was going to be? No, it's, it's, um, Oh, my relationship with my partner, Gavin, is um, we're just <laughs> fantastic buddies, and we laugh all the time, and we cuddle all the time, and, you know, so, so that part only deepens, and that part, there really was something meaningful about creating the ceremony yeah. of the wedding. Um, when you want to scrap all the sexism of the, of the wedding right. ceremony, then you actually have to be creative, right. and you have to dig in, and you have to say, what do we want to say to one another in front of people, and how do we want to commit to one another? Another. So I found it tremendously rewarding, and the relationship is is marvelous. <laughs> is he an attorney? He's not. He's a professor of journalism at Queens College. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. So yeah. you're both happy living in Queens, then? It's yes. That, that, that yes. Was not. But it's a wonderful message uh, to people who say, "Oh, I'm not a feminist, but I believe in this." To yes. see the other side about the feminist who becomes married and really <laughs> loves it. I think it was a, a great thing. That's what right. are some of the issues that you think are going to become paramount with students in the law school and what are they going to do? At CUNY Law yeah. particularly? Yeah. Well, um, there are a couple things that that we need to tackle. One is that we've struggled with our bar pass rate um, over mm. time and we really need to shore that up and make sure that that is at or, or exceeds the state bar Pass level. Is that an exam that meets all the standards it should meet? You know, there, there's a controversy about that. Some people critique the bar exam, um, and, and I think that can be a fruitful kind of discourse. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, the last dean of CUNY Law did. For me, I take the, the bar exam as a given, and yeah. I think we have to master it. Yeah. And um, Has the rate gone up? Because I know at one time yes. it was... 60% yes. or something. Yes, yeah. it has, and I think we need to continue to push push it forward. Right. The state average is about 75%, and 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 we're gonna we're gonna meet or exceed that within a number of years. Right. And then what about substantive issues? Immigration is yes. that an issue that's on it, the top it, of an agenda somewhere? It is, and and part of the reason is just the increasing diversity of the the United States generally, and it's also true that. Um, uh, immigration is just an incredibly salient political issue mm -hmm. as well and mm -hmm. social issue as well as um, uh, 
just a, a question of population shifts. So um, I think immigration is going to continue to be a crucial issue. We have a clinic in immigration um, and refugee rights, and it's it's really one of the stars. I read it today. There's a little thing in the in the paper today about him, a Mexican who has been here for two decades. He came here illegally. Right. He's obviously lived for two decades not illegally. He was stopped because he didn't have his headlights of the car on and they found that he had escaped from mm. a jail mm. someplace in the south um, one month short of the end of his sentence. Now what's going to happen to him? Mm. We know he's probably going to be deported. deported. Yeah. And he's in the meantime I'm assuming has established a family and has a job right, and everything right. else if he has a car. We haven't come to terms with immigration yeah. as, a, as a culture. Yeah. Um, we're deeply divided Crazy. about it. Um, and and I think and it's that it's being used as such a it campaign. Is such a campaign issue. Yes, it's just incredible. Yes. So what else beyond immigration? What else are people interested? Well, interestingly, in? the law is becoming more international. Uh -huh. People are talking about international rights and, and international trade and international issues more often. I think we're no longer thinking, particularly at CUNY law, we're no longer thinking just what is the and law the in this country and the community. Yeah. Yeah, but how does the law here compare with what's going on in South Africa or Australia or the EU? Um, and and what can we learn from that comparative analysis? So we have a number of factors members who are focusing on a comparative analysis in a whole range of public interest areas, yeah. which can be particularly enlightening. And very important. Yes, absolutely. We tend to think sometimes in this country that what we're doing is the only way to do it. Or, or the, that we're ahead of everybody, that's when in right. fact and we're not ahead of a lot of people, sometimes right? Sometimes that's not true, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you can learn a lot by assessing the, right. the laws of other right. countries. Well, we've come to the end of our program already. already. I can't believe it. So we can say a few things. One is you like living in New York. You I love, love it. Living. I love New York. You love being the dean of yes, CUNY Law it's School. it's a great job. And you're very supportive of the CUNY system. Absolutely. It's a, very good. Have you been to the other campuses? Do you, are you recruiting students from other campuses? Yeah, I was just at the John Jay uh, School yeah. last, uh, not last Saturday, but uh -huh. the Saturday before, and they're doing a, a, oh. a, a law institute and, and pre-law institute, and I was there and, and gave a talk to some John Jay students. Great. I've been to City College and a number of others, and I'm going to try to hit all of them this Great. year. Well, thank you very much for coming, thank and you lots so and much, lots Ron. of good luck, and we're very lucky to have you here. Thank, thank you. you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.